my fellow assassins, to another episode of the Dark Assassins Podcast, the show that dives deep into not just technology, but the concepts, software, and procedures behind it all, and explains it so simply that even your grandma can understand it. As always, I'm your host, the Dark Assassin. So, welcome to another episode, my fellow assassins. Welcome to a new year. Uh, And the reason I say a new year is because, believe it or not, we are officially into the second year of the Dark Assassins podcast. Now, I can't believe it either. Uh, It doesn't really feel like it's been a year since this podcast started, but uh, it did start back in April, beginning of April. I believe April 9th was the day the first episode went out. Uh, April 9th, 2022, and we are now into the middle of April 2023, and the reason why I didn't say last week's episode was the first of the second year was because technically, like I said, I believe last year the first episode came out on April 9th, and the episode from last week came out on April 8th, so we just missed the cutoff a little bit, uh, but no worries, we are in the second year now, so um, I guess here's to year two. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, but anyway, with that out of the way, let's get into this week's trivia question. So for this week's trivia question, this is a rather interesting one, I think, and this week's trivia question is, when was the first quantum computer created? When was the first quantum computer created? And if I had to guess... My assumption is your guess that you're thinking right now is probably way too recent, would be my guess, because when I was thinking about this for the trivia question, I was, my guess was also way too recent before I uh, learned what it was. So that is your trivia question for the week. Now, I have to come to you guys and repent for my sins Because as much as I like to hate on and joke about the, it works on my machine guy, um, I basically turned into the, it works on my machine guy this week. Now, before I walk away in shame and get burnt at the stake for my heresy, allow me to first take some copium while I try to justify to myself and to you, as Obi-Wan said, I became the very thing I swore to destroy. Now, I was doing a software delivery this week, and my code, of course, because I am talking about it worked on my machine, was working, at least I thought. So I delivered the code, and then the, uh, the tester that was testing the code responded back to me and was like, hey, so um, I found this bug, and... Um, and, you know, they, they listed through, hey, I found this bug and kind of went through like this general scenario of kind of the steps that they went through and discovered it. And I had never seen that bug before. Um, so I fired up my version of the software and tested it. And I tried everything I could think of to get it to basically to get it to come up, get the, the bug to show its face. And I couldn't get it to work. And I tried every different combination and iteration that I could think of of possible scenarios that were in the same premise that the tester gave me, and I just couldn't figure it out. So I responded to them and basically said, no, I hadn't seen that before, and then I gave them the whole laundry list of things that I tested to try and get it to work so hopefully they would respond back and you know be like maybe catch something I missed Um, and the other thing I also did was I referred them specifically to the build tools and all the stuff that I use to build the software I was using because uh, like we mentioned um, when this kind of thing happens of it works on my machine Uh, Sometimes it can come down to the build tools and the platform that you're building for, um, and that could be the reason why it doesn't work on another machine. So because I knew that the that the tools and stuff I was using 
was slightly different than what the tester was using, so I figured, hey, maybe that could be the case. Uh, but anyway, they responded back um, and basically gave me a more detailed um, way that they got the bug to crop up, which was very, very helpful to me since then I could actually go in and directly replicate the, the bug except I still couldn't replicate the bug and it still worked fine on my machine. Um, but the nice thing about it was because they were so detailed in how they described the bug to me and exactly what they did and where they got the bug to crop up, basically what I was able to do was program in a workaround that still allowed the code to function just exactly as it was supposed to, but the uh, certain section of the code that for them was causing the issue, I basically just went around that, so uh, basically resolving the bug. Um, so, you know, uh, I, while I couldn't get the bug to replicate, couldn't replicate it myself, which was kind of a bummer, um, I still, you know, was able to get the workaround, which, which I, I believe we've talked about on the podcast before, how important it is um, when you are reporting bugs or fixing bugs or whatever, to be as detailed as possible when reporting bugs to software devs. Because if you just say, hey, um, code no work, fix it please, the dev's going to you know, be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and then if you, so the more specific you can be, if you can really drive down and say, hey, you know, when I gave XYZ input on this interface, it gave me, you know, Z, or I think I already used Z, it gave me W output, you know? Um, and basically as specific as you can be, because that's what allows you as a developer to really be able to pinpoint where in the code the bug is coming from. But on the flip side though, if someone finds a bug in your code and for whatever reason you can't replicate it, you shouldn't just, you know, throw your hands up and be like, oh, well, that sounds like a you problem, buddy. It, it works fine for me. It works on my machine. Um, so that's obviously something that you don't want to do either. So there's this, there's really this kind of, I guess, dance you could say of the uh, the user or the testers and the developers of uh, really needing to work together and having that really good strong communication with one another and going back and forth, seeing what's causing the bug. If you can't replicate it, tell them what you tried. Um, did you do something different? And trying to you know really narrow in, really narrow down on. Uh, the issue because just like in the real world if your house is dark and there's a bug in your house the chances of that you're going to find the bug and squash the bug and get rid of it is probably pretty low just like if you are a software developer and a person tells you that there is a bug but doesn't give you any more details there's no light being shined about this bug at all it's going to be pretty hard for you to find that bug sure you might be able to track it down but the more light you can shine on the area more light you can shine on the code more light you can shine in your house the more likely you're going to see that bug and the more likely you're going to be able to squash it and get rid of it because uh, while some bugs can be a feature, and some people would argue that it is not a bug, it is a feature, um, some are just straight up bugs and you, you, you gotta get rid of them, right? It's like, you know, there are some bugs out there in the world that actually provide a net benefit, and then there are others, <coughs> mosquitoes, um, that are just pests and deserve to die and should be killed uh, on site. Um, so it, it's the same with software development too, right? You know, there's some bugs, um, kind of more when you, when you think of bugs as features, kind of generally you think of video games in certain instances, not all, 
um, where a bug will occur and it can like glitch you, you know, more items or more money or whatever the case may be. And then there's obviously the bad bugs that you need to kill instantly that are the security vulnerabilities or things that can allow attackers to exploit your your code and you know get ac- get root access to the system or something. Um, so those are obviously like the mosquitoes. You want to kill those and get rid of them on site. Get rid of them immediately. Um, but you know, just a testament here. Um, that um, I guess I have officially become a heretic and uh, I am now awaiting trial to be burned at the stake. Uh, But we did talk about how bugs can be security vulnerabilities and whatnot, so I think that is a good segue into this week's cybersecurity tip. So for this week's cybersecurity tip, this is going, this might sound a little off the walls, but stick with me. And that is the idea that your approach to security when it comes to protect, protecting your network or your infrastructure, your uh, computers, you know, whatever, you should take a Swiss cheese approach. Now, you might be thinking, why the heck would you want to take a Swiss cheese approach? How does that help your security? Swiss cheese is full of holes, and I thought you mentioned how you want to make sure you have as little access into your home network as possible. And you are exactly correct. But the thing is, when it comes to security, there is a line and a balance that you have to you know, there's, there's this thing that you have to balance between usability and security because you can have a machine that is impenetrable to hackers, uh, but it's not usable because it's unplugged, powered off, and sitting in the corner where no one can access it. But if you actually want to use the system, anytime you are using your computer, you're just opening yourself up to attacks and there's basically no way that you can prevent against all attacks unless you just like I said don't use the computer or the electronic device at all and just have it powered off unplugged sitting in the corner because then nobody can hack it Uh, but if you actually want to use your devices you need to Make sure you're like we talked. We've talked before about security and layers, right? And this is basically what the Swiss cheese approach is. Now, the Swiss cheese approach specifically is if we take an example of, say, you have your firewall, and your firewall, everything's closed off except you have one hole in it, which is your VPN connection, which allows you into your home network. So that's obviously a hole that someone could get through theoretically. So how do you plug that hole and still have access to everything else? Well, that's one piece piece of Swiss cheese. So then you take your other piece of Swiss cheese and you put your firewall piece of Swiss cheese on top of your other Swiss cheese. And let's say your second piece of Swiss cheese is a server with SSH access on it. Uh, that you can only access via, say, authorized SSH keys. Like, you disabled all password authentication um, on the system. So that would be another layer of Swiss cheese because that system can still be accessed remotely, which obviously you don't want remote access to a system because if an attacker gets remote access to a system, that's obviously not good. But because you have that piece of Swiss cheese layered behind your other piece of Swiss cheese, which is your firewall, then that gives you, there's less likelihood that someone would be able to get through the, the first hole and be able to get into the second hole. And basically the idea is you have all, a bunch of pieces of Swiss cheese, which are your, each layers of your defenses, but when you stack them all on top of each other, then it becomes a... I'm not going to say impenetrable because there's obviously still a chance you could theoretically get hacked, but it's a lot less likely than, you know, a straight line right through to the system, right? So it goes back, this is kind of goes right back to make sure you have multiple layers of security, but specifically the Swiss cheese approach of it's okay if you have 
you know, certain things open, you just need to make sure that you have additional layers, you know, preventing, you know, straight line direct through access to uh, the system. Like, one thing that definitely wouldn't be good is if you had, say, a server with SSH open with no password authentication at all, which I, I'm not sure if you're allowed to do that with SSH. Uh, I've never done it for obvious reasons, but let's say hypothetically you had a server that you could connect to and you didn't need any kind of credentials at all as long as you had the IP address and the port number you are able to get in. So the bad approach would be you open up a hole in your firewall like you would for your VPN connection, but instead of it being a VPN connection, you have it directly to your computer that doesn't have any kind of authorization on it. So that way you would have a you'd have your nice strong defense with your hole in the cheese, which is that open port on the firewall that goes directly into the system that an attacker could easily get into. And that's what you don't want. So the idea is, you know, you have multiple layers of restrictive restrictiveness to it in order to prevent attacks and whatnot. So that is the Swiss cheese method to security, which in a way might sound counterintuitive having holes everywhere. But when you put all those things together, while one piece might have a hole in it, another layer behind it would be able to block that hole and then therefore uh, prevent potential attacks on that certain vector. So that is your cybersecurity tip for the week. Now, before we get into the nerdy things I did this week, one thing that was quite funny, I thought, was last week I talked about the power draw of my home lab and how I wanted to maybe find a way to potentially reduce the power draw and kind of this, you know, internal battle, internal struggle of do I buy more hardware that's newer and more power efficient or do I just suck it up and pay the higher power bill? Well, I will say this first, I'm going to say this, that this is a joke. But I believe my power company was listening to that episode last week because literally minutes, or I guess maybe an hour or so after the episode went live, the power company heard that message and they're like, fam, we got you and cut power to my house. Be like, you know what? You want to cut the power consumption? We got you. We'll just cut your power. So obviously that's what that's obviously didn't happen and if that did happen um i have some strong words for the power company but i know it didn't happen because like my whole neighborhood was out um so but i just thought it was kind of funny that i happened to wake up the morning after that episode went live and uh my power was out but thankfully because of my uh devices with built-in ups systems Um, aka laptops, I was able to see exactly when the power went out, which like I mentioned was basically about an hour uh, after the episode went live, which was kind of funny. Um, Which I guess on the one hand, if I really wanted to cut my idle power consumption of my home lab, uh, I could always go with the nuclear option and um, just turn everything off. (laughs) And uh, I mean, it would work. Uh, well, obviously wouldn't be ideal, um, but but yeah. So I just, I just thought it was kind of funny. That was something that I was thinking about. Uh, the power company being like, oh, you want to cut your power consumption? We got you. Proceeds to cut the power to my house. And me being like, um, that's not exactly what I had in mind uh, when I talked about potentially reducing the idle power consumption, but I appreciate the thought. Now, with that said, let's get into... What nerdy stuff have I been up to this week? So, going back to the idea about the idle power consumption, last week I gave an estimate of how much my home lab actually draws in terms of power, and I figured that wasn't good enough. An estimate 
was not good enough. I needed some hard numbers, I needed the raw data, and I needed to see exactly how much power my home lab is sucking down. So I busted out my handy dandy kilowatt, which if you're not familiar with what, what a kilowatt is, it's basically just this uh, meter that you plug into your electrical outlet and then amongst other things you can plug other devices into it and it'll show you how much power is being drawn um, in terms of watts and whatnot. So for all my home lab devices that don't self-report their own power consumption, basically everything that isn't a rack mounted enterprise gear that just tells me how much power they draw, um, I plugged each one of those in um, to see how much power they're drawing at idle. And uh, turns out my guesstimate was pretty much spot on. Uh, but before I go hype up myself and in order to knock myself down a few pegs, when literally 85 to 90% of the power draw was coming from devices that I already knew how much power they drew because they told me, um, and then subsequently adding on a few extra watts for the other devices it's not exactly that um that impressive that my estimate was basically spot on so um if you're in the if you were in the camp that were like wow that that's great that you were so that was such a great guess uh yeah but again at the same time uh when the vast 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 like i mentioned 85 to 90 percent of the power draw, I already knew those numbers. Um, it's kind of easy to, you know, eh, add like 50, 60 watts here and call it an estimate, um, which is basically what it was. The other devices, I think, accounted for uh, something like, I think it was just under 60 watts uh, was, was how much they drew compared to the Enterprise gear, which was drawing like 170, 135, and 110-ish, respectively. Um, so, yeah, Enterprise gear can uh, definitely uh, suck down the juice, that is for sure. Um, now, another thing that I did this week was, I'm not sure if you guys remember this, uh, long-time listeners may remember, but maybe not. So for, as a refresher, months and months ago, I had installed an RX 550 into one of my um, hypervisors that I was using in order to do video transcoding for Jellyfin. And I mentioned when I installed the card that I was having an issue where whenever I would try to restart or shut down the VM, the VM would essentially just kernel panic and crash and would just freeze and I couldn't do anything with it, couldn't access it, couldn't do nothing. If I tried to shut it down from the Proxmox web GUI, it wouldn't work, so I had to like hard stop it. And it was kind of annoying any time that I wanted to, especially when I was using my Ansible update playbook, because every now and then when uh, it would... Uh, have the flag set to true to reboot the system because of maybe a like a kernel update or something it would try to reboot and then it would obviously not reboot and fail and then I would get this nice error in my uh, um, Ansible output being like yeah it failed on this you know the Jellyfin server because it obviously didn't come back up after the reboot because it was frozen and crashed so I actually, I did, I got back around to doing some more digging on the issue, and I found what the issue was, and it's a pretty stupid one. Because obvious, a lot of the time, which long-time listeners of the podcast would probably be able to guess, a lot, a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time when I have an issue like this of something that just isn't working, it's generally because I did something stupid. Now, this is no different because what happened was, I guess my best guess is I just assumed that I should be fancy with the VM because I looked at the the default display settings, or I, I guess rather I looked at the display settings for the VM, and all my VMs are set to just default for the display settings. But this VM in particular was set to like OpenGL 
I think it I don't think it was called OpenGL, but it was basically using OpenGL with a dedicated GPU. And I was like, you know, this GPU's got OpenGPL. Why don't I make use of it? Ha ha, I am fancy. Um, and turns out that that was the reason because I saw that and decided what the heck I'll try to switch it back to default I switched it back to default and then I was able to start stop restart shut down the VM without any issues So, uh, yeah, that was my issue just a dumb configuration thing that I made um, when I was creating the VM um, which honestly I'm not even sure why I decided to use that OpenGL VM or display setting in the first place because it's not like this VM even has a GUI to it. It's literally just a command line. So I don't exactly know why I decided to go that route. But but anyway, it's I disabled it, set it back to default, and now it works like it's supposed to. So I guess that's... I mean, it's good. Uh, I'm happy with it now. Uh, but it's just kind of funny that that was the, the issue all along was just a bad configuration on my part. Um, now, the more interesting thing that I think uh, I want to talk about was last week I talked about working with Stable Diffusion and getting that up and running and how some of the creations that it made were quite interesting. But one thing I was not able to do was get it trained on myself and be able to generate images of me. And I got that working this week. And that was definitely a huge win. Um, now, one issue with the model I trained, which again, the only person I can blame is myself, is... Some of the images are kind of, there, there's some weirdness to them, mainly because the the uh, training data I gave it, the source images I gave it. And the other thing is, is I look a lot younger in the images that it generates of me, assuming they're good, which not all of them are. But the ones that actually look like me generally make me look a lot younger than I actually am. And the reason for that is because I am an introverted code monkey that just occasionally breaks stuff in his home lab, and I don't take pictures of myself. So trying to scrap, trying to source pictures of me that are actually a good enough quality of my face to be able to use in this training data, we had to go back in the archives. Like I'm talking, probably at least seven to eight years was like some of the photos that I was pulling from and the most recent photos that I think I was able to find were like at least three years old if not like four so a lot of the 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 images I used for myself I was a lot I was younger by a decent amount so obviously I guess it makes sense that I look younger because it's you know the data it was given I look a lot younger um, but with that said some of the images that it actually generated could honestly actually pass as me. Obviously not me today because, like I said, the I look younger. But if, but if for if you like compared a side by side of a picture of me from like four or five years ago or something with some of the images that it's generated, it would be you would in in some of them you would be hard pressed to discern which one was a legit image and which one was not. So it on the images that it can actually do well, it's done a pretty bang up job, um, which is, you know, I think is pretty cool, especially when you consider the fact that I trained this model locally and it's running inside of my home lab and not out there in the cloud for some company or organization to exploit data from me so I think that is pretty cool that I get to play with this you know pretty powerful tool and technology um, whenever I want inside of my home lab which I also will say I spent a very very lot of, large amount of time this week specifically in the evenings pretty much like I'd eat dinner and then I would just be playing around with stable diffusion like nonstop just generating images because I was having way too much fun with it. Um, 
but it, yeah, it was it was definitely a fun time. I I will say, especially when I was able to start uh, trying to make images of me in you know super weird and random scenarios, which I will say it did struggle to generate good pictures of me in like other situations. Like if I just asked it for a photo of me, it generally did a pretty good job. But if I asked, you know, a picture of me um, in cyberpunk or a picture of me as a, a cowboy or, or something like that, it, it generally tended to struggle a decent amount. Um, like it would kind of have the the gen like the the face kind of sort of resembled me like you could see the resemblance but it wasn't nearly as good as if I just asked it for a photo of me um but but yeah that was definitely a lot of fun to play around with now I will say um I did have to do some tinkering I had to add like some extra command line arguments when running stable diffusion in order to actually get the the model to train correctly because I mentioned last week I was running into this issue with uh, memory issues and it was saying like I didn't have enough GPU memory or whatever so I had to uh, do some specific settings for a lower a slightly lower end GPU now I will say if you are planning on running stable diffusion yourself uh, the general guidelines and from my own experience is pretty much eight gigs of VRAM is basically the minimum of what you need um, especially if you're going to be training models. If you're just going to be generating images, you might be able to get away with like six maybe, um, but it's definitely very much VRAM intensive. So the more VRAM you can have, um, the better off you're going to be. Plus, just in general, if you have a card that has more VRAM, generally speaking, it's more powerful and therefore you'll have a better experience in the sense that you'll get images a lot quicker um, than if you had say a slower GPU um, so that's another thing to keep in mind if you're thinking about doing this yourself um, but I, I would highly recommend if you have the the capability and have the the GPU to be able to use stable diffusion to get it running on your like you can even just run it on like a laptop or a desktop or something you don't need a dedicated server uh, to run it on so that that is something that is pretty cool um, now talking about servers I guess that is a, a good segue into something that I really wanted to talk about which I kind of was thinking about a little bit you know thinking of um, you know this the idea of buying new stuff and replacing old enterprise stuff or power efficiency stuff and it got me thinking again of what you should consider when trying to buy a server or build a server uh, for your home lab. So when we're when you're talking about building or buying a server for your home lab, there's a couple key things you have to consider first. And the first, the main things that you have to consider is what are you planning on using it for and what are you planning on running? Like if you're planning on having a NAS or a network attached storage, are you planning on doing virtualization stuff? Are you planning on running Docker containers? Like it really depends on what you're trying to do to be able to point you in the right direction of what kind of hardware and what kind of specs you should be looking for. Because if, say for example, that you want to like just run Docker containers, for example, you don't need that high end of hardware to run Docker containers because generally Docker containers are pretty low impact to your system. Now there's obviously some Docker containers out there that are slightly more resource intensive, but when you compare them to running a full fat VM, they're definitely a lot more lightweight and you can run a lot more of them on uh, lesser spec hardware. Now, on other things you have to consider when trying to source a home server is power draw concerns. I know over the past few years that's been kind of a, a big deal of how expensive power is, especially over in uh, the European side of things. Generally in America it's uh, cheaper, although it has, at least I've noticed it has crept up some over the past few years, but definitely not as bad as those of you in Europe. So those of you in Europe with uh, 
data centers like me, I feel for you because that is a lot of power and therefore it's going to cost you quite a bit. Um, another thing you need to consider is do you need a PCIe expansion? Because that's also going to dictate what kind of platforms and what kind of other hardware you're going to need to get in order to be able to account for that PCI expansion. Another thing you want to consider is how much remote access do you need to the system? Like, do you need a, like a lights out management or an IPMI type uh, remote access to that system? Or are you fine with just, you know, if you're, say, running TrueNAS or Proxmox or VMware or some other system, just managing it through its its web UI or whatever. And then if it's ever in a powered off state, you know, just using something like Wake on LAN or something, is would that suffice? Or do you need that, you know, um, IPMI or lights out management type of a thing? Um, so the other thing that you also have to weigh is how many cores and how much RAM do you need? Because if you're planning on doing something like running a ton of virtual machines, obviously you're going to want a lot of cores and you're going to want a lot of RAM. But if you're going to skimp anywhere, I would skip on the cores for this reason specifically, because... If you're running a lot of VMs, if you're like me and like most home labbers, chances are the majority of your VMs are going to be idling. I would say probably like over 99, probably at least 95% of the time, if not more. So you generally don't, you don't need as much CPU horsepower and CPU cores as you would think. Now, the caveat to that, though is if you're like me and you have an Ansible playbook to update all your servers at once, then as they're all trying to do updates, they're all trying to use CPU resources at the same time. So if you don't have enough cores, you're going to run into some serious bottlenecks in that department. But you can deal with those bottlenecks. The problem is you can't deal with the lack of RAM. Because at a certain point, you're going to run out of RAM, and then you're not going to be able to run any more VMs. You can throw more VMs on a system even if, quote-unquote, all the cores are allocated. Because obviously not all those cores are going to be in use all the time. So it's generally you can generally over-provision, as we say, uh, or allocate more resources than you have when it comes to CPU time. Because the chances of, especially in a home lab situation, of all of your cores being utilized at the same time and some VM not being able to get any CPU time is basically zero unless you're running like a a four core machine and you have like 30 VMs running then you're probably going to run into some issues some pretty big issues but for the for the general home labber out there i would say that you're probably not going to run into an issue if you over provision your CPU. Now, obviously, like I mentioned, RAM is a different story because you can only have so many VMs running with so with a set amount of RAM. Um, so that's one thing that you definitely want to make sure you have enough of when you're building out your system. And it's it's one thing you need to also consider when looking at what platform you're going to go with if you are either going to buy or build out a home lab server because you need to take into consideration the RAM expandability options. Uh, because some motherboards, for example, will only have a dedicated number of RAM slots. So if you, say, have only four RAM slots available and you populate all four of those, if you want to upgrade your RAM down the line, you're going to have to buy completely new RAM kits um, to replace your RAM kits that you already have installed. Whereas, say, if you had like an enterprise server and you only had half of the RAM slots populated, all you'd have to do is buy however much extra RAM you want, and then you can put them in the open slots and you're good to go. You don't have to buy, you know, if you say you have 32 gigs, you don't need to buy 64 gigs, so you'll have 64 gigs. You'd only need to buy an extra 32 gigs, so you could potentially save yourself some money there. So there's, those are some other considerations um, that you need to take into account. And then the other thing you also have to consider, too, is specifically if you're trying to build a NAS, um, you have to consider uh, 
the hard drives. How many hard drives are you going to have? How big are they going to be? Um, because obviously if you have more hard drives, that's good in the sense that you can put them in some kind of RAID configuration and increase your speed and redundancy. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have more drives, that could that adds more power draw. Um, so maybe would that become an issue for you? On the other hand, you could go with SSDs, which would draw less power and give you better performance across the board. But at the same time, SSDs are have a higher cost per gigabyte than hard drives do. Like I was looking at hard drives not too long ago and the prices on hard drives have, and SSDs for that matter too, but hard drives especially has been absolutely tanking. So if you need to pick up some high capacity used hard drives, now is a pretty good time to do it because I saw, I think it was like some six terabyte drives. I think we're going for like somewhere in like the $40 per six terabyte drive range, something like that, which is kind of insane. Um, so there's definitely some good deals out there for sure. Um, but then I guess the other consideration is, I think we, we talked about this on a previous episode, which is, do you actually need a rack? And I would say no, specifically for those that are new to the home lab industry or looking to build out their first home server, I would not recommend you get a rack. Um, and even speaking from personal experience, the first home server that I got was an old Dell Optiplex desktop uh, rocking a, a third gen i5 in it. So, and, and that served me well for a while. It's on it. It's actually still in use in my home lab. I talked about, um, a hypervisor holding that, uh, RX 550. Uh, that's that same Optiplex. Uh, I've since upgraded it some since I originally bought it. Uh, but it still has been serving me excellently. It's been fantastic. Um, and the reason why like old used desktops are so great for home servers is because one, they're pretty darn low power. Like for context, that Optiplex with a dedicated GPU installed is drawing around, I think, 26 watts at idle. And for context, the uh, lowest power draw hypervisor enterprise grade hypervisor I have is like 110 watts idle so that's a pretty significant difference in power draw um, now obviously granted the uh, enterprise server has a heck of a lot more RAM and a heck of a lot more cores but if you're just starting out in the home lab game or just trying to build your first home server you don't necessarily need 16 cores and 32 threads like that hypervisor I mentioned has. Now, as someone new to the home labbing game, obviously you don't need that many cores, right? The Optiplex, it has uh, four cores and eight threads, pretty basic, um, just like basically any Intel CPU from pretty much second gen up through like seventh was basically four cores four threads on the i7 range um which um also speaking on that because it draws a lot less power it's also a lot quieter which is a nice thing um and it is obviously because it's a lot quieter and produces less heat it uh well actually if it uses less power and is and is quieter it will then produce less heat which is also nice especially if your home lab is on the, the second floor of your house that gets baked by the sun which obviously makes it even hotter by default so you obviously want to limit the heat output if uh, that's anyone besides just me now the other thing that's nice about you know old desktops is how generally cheap and affordable they are like i think pretty sure most businesses are doing a, uh, a a refresh right now because sites like eBay are absolutely flooded with 6th and 7th gen Intel devices for pretty darn cheap. And, and I'm, when I say cheap, I'm saying you can get a 6th or even a 7th gen Intel machine right now for ballpark i'll say a hundred dollars now depending on what kind of ram and storage configurations you're getting you can even find them for 
well under $100. And if you're wanting a higher spec one with, you know, like a higher spec SSD and more RAM, it, it'll be over $100. But generally, you, you should easily be able to find 6th or 7th gen Intel chips for a hundred bucks, which is honestly a pretty good deal seeing that, I mean, sixth and seventh gen Intel still provides pretty darn good performance, um, especially if you're early in the home labbing, home labbing game. Um, and for only around a hundred bucks, even less in some cases, generally pretty good. And it's still, like I mentioned, can do a pretty good job at virtualization tasks too. Uh, like I mentioned, my my Optiplex, which is running a third gen Intel CPU, which is obviously a lot older, um, so you'd pro you'd even see better power efficiency gains with the sixth and seventh gen stuff. Um, I mean, it's doing virtualization stuff and performing like a champ. Um, now, the downsides, obviously, is the lack of PCI expansion on some of the desktop uh, platforms. Now, it's not necessarily because the motherboard lacks PCI expansion. Um, in the case of my Optiplex, it has a at least, I think it has four PCI Express slots, two of them I think being X16, I believe, um, which is generally the, the largest slot size for things like graphics cards. Um, but the problem is, comes down to the CPU support. Like the CPU that I have installed can only support 16 lanes of PCI expansion. So if I plugged in, uh, say, a, a graphics card that uses 16 lanes, I can't use any of the other PCI Express slots, which is in contrast to the server, like the enterprise server grade stuff, like the, the, the Xeon line, for example, the, the Xeons that I've been using, they're generally like kind of equivalent to the third gen Intel stuff. Each one of those CPUs can do like 40 lanes by themselves. And both of the systems I have running that that generation of Xeon, the uh, equivalent to third gen Intel, um, each one of those has two of them. So theoretically, you'd have like 80 lanes of PCI, exp PCI Express expansion. Now, obviously, I don't use all those lanes, um, but I do use more than what I would have available to me on say just a regular desktop system so that's one downside another downside is generally speaking you won't have any kind of remote management capabilities to these systems like an, an, a built-in ipmi for example now you could theoretically install like i've seen people install like a, a pi kvm or something on like a pci express card that they'll plug in as in one of their pci slots and then uh run like an hdmi cable or something to their systems output and get like ipmi access that way uh but that is additional cost and if if honestly if you're buying a um a, one of these cheap uh, old desktop systems for like 100 bucks, you're literally going to be spending more money on the KVM solution than the actual uh, desktop itself. So that's that's one thing you have to consider. And then the other thing, as I've, as I've mentioned before, is you're limited to the number of CPU cores and threads that you're going to be able to have in the desktop line, um, specifically if you're going not like bleeding edge, like the newest, latest, and greatest stuff from Intel and AMD from the past couple of years. Now, if you go like AMD from the past, uh, somewhere, in the, I guess in the past like five years, you might be able to get something with like eight cores and 16 threads. Uh, but that's generally kind of where you're going to be at like the five year mark. Then if you're going something newer than that, you might be able to get, you know, more cores, more threads. But obviously that's going to cost you quite the premium uh, compared to going something older. So that is one thing you have to keep in mind with um, desktop systems is you're going to be limited um, in the number of CPU cores and threads, and also in the RAM department too. Like I mentioned, my my Optiplex that's running a third de third gen Intel CPU, uh, it can only 
use 32 gigs of RAM. So I can't, even if I wanted to put more RAM in there, I couldn't because the CPU is limited. Um, plus the other limitation of that system is it only has four RAM slots. Now, some of you might be saying only, that's the, I only use like two and my system has four, or I only use one and my system has two, or you know, whatever the case may be. Um, some other boards have less, some have more, but that is one thing that you also have to consider um, if you're going with the desktop line is you're going to be more limited in RAM because if you look at some of the Xeon lines like my R620 and my other hypervisor that use um, E5 J V2 CPUs those guys if I wanted to I could put a terabyte and a half of RAM in them and they would be fine yes I said that right a terabyte and a half Obviously, I'm not that insane and my pockets aren't that deep, but if I wanted to, I could. So that's one thing that you that you have to consider, which is generally why um, you'll see people that do a ton of virtualization stuff tend to opt for like old enterprise gear because they can stick a ton of cores and a ton of RAM in the system um, and be fine. Uh, whereas if you went with the desktop route, you would be a little more limited. Now, obviously, because the desktop route could be cheaper, um, you could essentially make a, a cluster of these desktop systems um, and do it that way. Uh, but then you also kind of, I guess, could make the argument, but with, you know, the, you have to add up all the power consumption of those. And at that point, you might as well just buy a rack mounted enterprise server. Uh, because it would draw the same amount of power and you could get more resources in there. But then again, on the flip side, we talked about in a previous episode, you don't want to have single points of failure. So if you just had one server running all your VMs, if you ever had to take that server down, all your VMs also go down. Whereas if you had multiple desktop systems, you could easily take one down and not your entire lab goes down so there's obviously trade-offs pros and cons to every side of this argument like that like i've mentioned before with home labs there is no silver bullet there is no one best thing uh in the home lab there really is it's really up to you when it comes to what you want in your home lab um now again like i mentioned for any any noobs newbies out there that are first getting into the the home lab sphere i would not recommend going with the rack mounted idea at first for a few reasons the first of which i mentioned in a previous uh episode um racks can be generally pretty expensive unless you can get lucky and find one for basically free um but generally if you're gonna buy a rack mount a rack mounted server and then you're gonna buy a rack for it to go into there's a decent chance you're gonna be spending the same amount of money on the rack as you are for the server itself so basically making the cost of entry double which is not good um now but the other thing too is if you haven't you know played around with it and you haven't gotten your feet wet you want to see if you actually enjoy the hobby before you start sinking your life savings into it like some of us idiots are doing. Um, so you don't want to, I mean, and that goes for any hobby, right? Like you don't want to say, you know, buy the, the highest end set of golf clubs and the best golf shoes and entire golf wardrobe um, and buy a golf membership to the best golf club in the, in your local area or whatever just to go out for your first time golfing realize you hate it and never want to do it again obviously that's that's not what you want to do you want to you know test it out first see if it's something that you enjoy and then you can go um and start really getting into it um so that that's kind of my recommendations and then the other thing i guess you should also consider um in addition to what you're going to be using the system for is potential upgradability down the line because one thing that you'll find very quickly is you always have a niche to upgrade something or buy new hardware or something 
even if your hardware is more than adequate and more than capable to handle everything you need it to do and more, you'll still find yourself wanting to upgrade. So if your platform is essentially dead at this point, like I'll take my Optiplex for example, uh, I can't upgrade the CPU anymore. It's the highest end it can go. I can't upgrade the RAM anymore. Uh, I put the most in it that I can. So it's basically a dead end right now. Now, obviously, it's also kind of a dead end because it's a third de third gen Intel chip, which I'm not sure how old that is, but it's over. I think it's around the decade mark, if not maybe a couple years older than that. Um, so it's not like it's uh, getting any younger. So that's also something to consider. Now, if, so for example, if you bought like a, an enterprise server, you could, you know, get it specced with, you know, something pretty minimal and then upgrade it as your, as your needs grow. Like for example, my R620, I believe when I bought that um, I'm trying to remember the exact specs. I believe it was two E5 2670s, just the V1 CPU, and I think it came with 64 gigs of RAM. And then since uh, my I've you know used it a lot more, added a bunch more VMs on there. I've since upgraded the CPUs in it and upgraded the RAM in it, and I still have plenty of extra RAM slots if I wanted to upgrade the RAM. So there's definitely a lot of expandability. Uh, in that department. So that's that's another thing you want to also consider um, when you're trying to make a home lab server purchase. But I mean, like we said, I mean, you could spend as little as, I would say even cheaper if you wanted to get like a Raspberry Pi, but we all know how hard those are to come by. Um, but you could, I mean, depending on what your budget is, you could easily if you wanted to go even lower spec, like if you wanted a, a third gen i7 like my Optiplex, you could probably find those. I don't, I don't know, but I'm assuming you could probably find those for like under, probably in like the fifty to sixty buck range, maybe, which is generally pretty affordable if you're trying to trying to get into this. Um, so it it's really the, there's the whole range. You can go from like fifty bucks to like thousands or even tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands if you're buying like a new enterprise server which i don't know why you would buy a new enterprise server like from a manufacturer i mean don't get me wrong as awesome as it would be to say get the latest and greatest i don't know what they're up to like the dell r seven 50 or 760 whatever the latest one is like max spec everything as cool as that would be um i don't i'm not exactly willing to take out a mortgage for that in order to pay for it so yeah that's not gonna happen uh but i mean it would be definitely cool to have don't get me wrong um but uh but yeah so before we go let's get into this week's trivia question which is what what when was the first quantum computer created if you said 1998 you are correct and bonus points if you said it had 2 qubits so a whopping 2 qubits i know jam packed full of qubits now for some context uh, the most advanced quantum computers nowadays have like 433 from IBM, and D-Wave has another one with over 5,000, I believe. Now, if you're wondering why there's a large disparity there, they're using two different, I guess, architectures for how they're doing their quantum computing. So the IBM version is using a circuit-based quantum processor, which kind of resembles logic gates, which... If you're unfamiliar how a normal CPU works that's in your your smartphone or your laptop or desktop works is it has these logic gates which are made up of AND gates and OR gates, essentially ones and zeros, but quantum so the quantum gates are essentially kind of replicating that but in the quantum realm and the quantum realm uses this has this idea of superpositioning where the the qubits can be in a state of one zero and a one and a zero at the same time. 
Um, don't ask me how that works. I have no idea. I'm not a quantum physicist. I am a code monkey that occasionally breaks stuff in his home lab, so I don't know. Um, and the other one that D-Wave uses is a quantum annealing method. Um, now, I'm not going to try to pretend I know how these, these uh, technologies work because I don't. Um, but I will say from uh, my brief looking at, you know, kind of how they work, some, some quick search uh, yields, um, they basically give formulas that I would say are 99% just letters and symbols, which to the untrained eye at quick glance would probably mistake them for Egyptian hieroglyphics, and I wouldn't blame you because they um, don't have really many numbers at all, um, which is not the math you want to see um, if you're not familiar with something. That's You get into the scary, spooky symbols and letters, and um, when math starts having a bunch of letters and symbols and numbers, that's where you start to scare off a lot of people for sure. Um, but anyway, the best explanation I could find for these was, like I said, the, the quantum gates kind of tries to resemble normal computers with the, uh, the whole ones and zeros, except like I said, qubits can be one, zero or one and zero at the same time. Um, and so, and, and, but I guess the, the best explanation I can say is why is this is a super, super dumbed down version but when things get really small, like at the quantum realm, um, things don't act like they normally do at larger sizes. It's weird stuff. Um, but then on the other side, the quantum annealing stuff, um, a super, super duper dumbed down version that is basically the, the best I can describe it in a, in a, in a way that makes kind of sense to me that is also stupidly dumbed down. Um, is you're basically trying to throw stuff at a wall and see what sticks is essentially what it, what's happening since basically the the way it works is it like it throws it gives the the quantum qubits uh, data and then it tries to find the minimum energy states um, and that and based on those energy states that's how it can find the the most likely optimal solution. So because things in nature tend to seek a minimum energy state, if the quantum, the quantum annealing finds those qubits that are closest to the minimum energy states, and that's generally uh, where the, the optimal solution will, or close to optimal solution will lie. And generally they uh, use this quantum annealing stuff for things that are more uh, for like combinatorial optimization problems. So like, um, I don't know, maybe you have some insanely large number that could possibly use to encrypt data. And then I don't know, maybe you want to find two very also large prime numbers that multiplied together to get to that other big large number that could also maybe sort of be used for encrypting data. I don't know, just a thought here. Um, so those are, you know, the, the two methods, uh, for them. Um, and then, but the, the main issue with quantum computing, specifically these kinds that use a semiconducting variant is you can't, well, the, the problem is the, the amount of cooling that's required. And unlike Intel, modern Intel CPUs that just run so darn hot that anything aside from like a you know industrial freezer um, to keep them cool will suffice. The reason why these take so much cooling is because in order for the quantum states and quantum entanglements to be valid and accurate, you need to have a super cold temps like basically absolute zero or zero Kelvin negative. 273 Celsius or about negative 460 Fahrenheit. And this is because the uh, the thermal environment could actually affect the qubits and cause fluctuations in them, which could then lead to errors. So, yeah. Quantum is a crazy thing. I don't 
well, I haven't done much looking into it, but the the whole idea of quantum mechanics, like I'm sure a lot of people, kind of goes over my head. Um, but it, it's definitely cool to see where this is going um, and, and where it'll go. But I thought that would be a, an interesting uh, trivia question. And that on, I don't know about you guys, but it, it also did kind of blow my mind that uh, the first quantum computer was created in 1998. Um, like, we really haven't heard much about quantum computing until, like, semi-sort of recently. So that's why I was thinking, like, personally, I thought maybe, like, somewhere in the 2010s maybe would be the first quantum computer. But I was uh, over a decade off, like a decade and a half. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, kind of crazy that it's been around that, that long. Um, now, if you enjoyed this episode, I ask that you leave it a rating and review and subscribe to the Darkest Hats podcast if you haven't done so already. Also, be sure to share with a friend or family member who you think might enjoy this episode. And also, if you have any questions about this episode or have any questions or topics for future episodes, you can shoot me an email at contact at darkassassinsinc.com. There is a link for that down in the show notes below. And that's going to do it for me in this episode of the Dark Assassins Podcast. Until next time, my fellow assassins, remember, bull nothing equals true. If action not equal to null, return true. I'll see you next time on the Dark Assassins Podcast. <laughs>